Okay, guys. We wanted to sort of get tension in the scene. Those two guys over there, they're my colleagues. Small, subtle things just has an inherent tension in it. Well, you're American, okay? What kind of American are you? It's how long can you draw out the silence of it? What? Even just micro where he'd just adjust the gun a little bit. It's so unsettling. The, the game was to sort of keep it as uncut as possible, really, and make everything count. What about you? Where are you from? There's tension within that. It's trying to find the moments that you can build tension and, and just sort of cacophony. <laughs> and I think really the game of editing, turn up every single tiny micro emotion you have towards the material, gives you a clear cinematic experience. We brought in the editor, Jake Roberts, to get a masterclass on how to escalate tension and explore the storytelling and editing of A24's biggest movie, Civil War. He explains how the tone of one scene affects a needle drop five minutes later, how the opening scene was never in the script, but made in the edit, and how to develop an emotional arc with characters without using dialogue. And we begin with an edit breakdown of the college shootout sequence. This is the editing podcast brought to you by Mubi. If you're new here, please subscribe. How we were able to make that through editing feel realistic. Sonically, which was always, they, they were shooting real blanks on set. They creating a, essentially a, a actual gunshot sound. <laughs> It was one of the things that sort of obsessed Alex was exactly recreating the echo of the gun. Because in that very concrete environment of that yeah. set, there was this funny slap echo that was the gunshots yeah. were creating for the actors. It was quite traumatizing. I mean, yeah. like, like being next to those guns with the, the bullets going off. So without that, if they were all just firing silent guns and not, it would have had a huge impact on just the tone of the, the feel of the film. That ah, is so cool. Talk about the sound with that too, because it seemed like a distinct choice to take the picture, have the the shutter sound, and then silence. It was quite nice to sort of break up the cacophony of all those gunshots because it kind of it just freezes time for a minute and pay attention to the image more. I think. It's quite a jarring cut to do it, but yet it still needs to feel smooth. Well, how are you trying to maybe set up for those photographs to come in and it to not be throwing me off? Sort of trial and error sometimes, you don't you put it on the downbeat of a, so, I mean, you can have a barrage of, if you have like four gunshots in a row, you put it where the fifth one would be. That can be one of the ways, but I don't know, it wasn't a hard and fast rule. It was, there's just a place that feels right. Oh, you know, someone says a line and then it's like, how many frames, do you drop it like hard on the cut or do you, it'll do to do the speed of how the person was talking beforehand or, or the speed of the track that you're coming into or, you know, but it, it's just like a, 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 it's, a gut it's feeling. Really and then the, the, in that sequence was one of the ones where a lot of the times where we used still frames throughout the film were planned and intentional. Come on. So we had to sort of, create those stills that they shot it didn't just essentially repurposing footage from the film because a lot of the times they were shot specific, especially and in later sequences or early sequences Kaylee actually had film on her camera she, some of the stills are actually the actors stills we went through all the stills that they actually shot and if they were usable we used them that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I love they that. They got their actual Some pictures in the movie. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. The shutter sound on Kirsten Stills is the shutter sound from her camera, but also it's different to the shutter sound on... They're sort of, in a very subtle way, they have sort of distinct voices. Yeah. And then there was kind of an erupt cut out of that scene, right. and then there was a whole build-up of just what felt like five minutes of them going up the stairs. I mean, I always like quite assertive cuts. It's just trying to constantly keep mixing it up so that you don't sort of fall into a pattern of going, yeah, I know what, I know what, mm -hmm. and I get this, this is, okay, now we're, now we're in this zone. And so you go from the very, very quiet scene the night before. I thought I was sending a warning home. Don't do this. But here we are. 
they're contemplating the gunfire to the very hard cut into the kinetic gunfire and you get we're barraged with that for 90 seconds. <laughs> And then you into this silent, quite mysterious climb up the stairs. That sequence we were talking about culminates with definitely the most counterintuitive and arresting needle drop in the film, which is the De La Soul track. <laughs> We tried so many different things there, and then we, we both absolutely loved that track, and we, I don't know what prompted us to think of trying it in the first place, but I mean, we we didn't think for a minute it would work, and it sort of doesn't work, is sort of the point. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, sort yeah. of, it's completely wrong in so many ways, but then weirdly, we, we were both out of like, like, it's sort of almost worked. And yet, it's a really fun track, and it's, and you can't, you know, it's the sort of track you want to dance to take your foot, and, and therefore that's sort of challenging you to sort of enjoy the music and yet be horrified by the images. It keeps you, I, I think as an audience, I assume it keeps you on edge. I mean, I've never had the experience of watching the film not knowing what's, <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. what's coming next. Let me tell you, it does. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why that music cue was so interesting to me is because like, we look at some other classic war movies, let's say Apocalypse Now, one of the most iconic soundtracks when the helicopters are flying in. But of course that makes war look cool. Whereas I think this movie was also kind of making us uh, look at war a bit more of an objective view of like, hey, actually, this is a pretty awful thing. And I think the music cue of that with those people being executed, it was like the movie was kind of like, how dare this movie make me feel this way? Or that music cue also gave a really good story for Haley for her kind of standing up and like kind of entering this world and in her way kind of enjoying it. Like she kind of felt very comfortable. This was cool for her. She had her first real taste of mm. the narcotic of the adrenaline, right? Which is clearly what Joel's character is. Whereas Kirsten's character sort of has a different association with the addiction, but there's no less, you know, the the, the whole note section of that song and the lyric is literally you've something like along the lines of you've got my body now you want my soul. Want my soul. That's one of those yeah. lyrical correlations that I was saying we didn't we didn't really sort of initially that wasn't why we selected it, but once you kind of go you go oh look that hits there and that's sort of what the the, the dance between those two characters is, is Lee trying to tell the younger person not to follow my footsteps. There is no version of this that isn't a mistake. I know, because I'm it. But at the same time, sort of being seduced by the other character and sort of being like, can't help but wanting to draw her in, you know, actually respect her and actually think she's got talent. On the one hand, she's trying to present mm. a cautionary tale. On the other hand, she's sort of being a, becoming a mentor. Ah, uh, that's interesting, yeah. That was the sort of tension in that, in that relationship, in that moment. Absolutely, yeah, is sort of played out visually there to some extent and, and somewhat helped by that track. Excuse me. Do you have the time? I watch a lot of movies. Like, a lot. Like, I can't stop. And sometimes I do need to find, like, the best movies and ones from... All around the world and i can find them on mubi mubi is the streaming service where you can find some of the best directors and emerging auteurs from movies all around the world and all of them are hand curated there's no algorithmic selection here and the movie that's been getting my juices flowing recently is a small film called nimic that Yorgos Lanthimos made in 2019. It's a truly absurd little film that's so visually arresting in that classic Yorgos style. You know, it's got fisheye lenses, long awkward takes. There's just something about it that just stuck with me. So discover the best movies anywhere on Mubi. Well, if I actually gotta be honest, watching it on your phone is a bit of a disservice. I'm gonna go watch it on my TV. Ugh. What I'm curious about is, was there any conversation or what is the the editing language of an Alex Garland project? I did ask him quite early on, you know, how loose an aesthetic was, did he see it having? And he didn't, you know, he, I think the phrase he uses is, it's, it's definitely not going to be freeform jazz. It's, <laughs> it's going to be, Alex didn't want to shoot Steadicam. He doesn't particularly like Steadicam. And they 
I think they're the first film ever to shoot on these real Ronin things, which, okay. mm-hmm. and they have a fluid, it's like a, almost like, yeah, a, it's, it's like, like almost gimbal. like a steady cam that you hold in your hand. And really finding that bit of technology was kind of unlocked the aesthetic of the film for him and Rob and the operator to be able to start to work out, okay, we can both retain our kind of smoother, slightly more considered aesthetic, yeah. but within, but but at the same time, throwing the camera around and getting into spaces and 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 also just shooting at the speed they had to shoot. But I mean, beyond that, Alex and I, you know, I'm pretty sure of almost every director I work with, the lack of sort of conversations one has beforehand is probably quite surprising to people. I mean, you kind of, he sent me the screenplay during lockdown and he just goes, you know, what do you think? I go, I think it's great. And he goes, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah. And, <laughs> and then we had like one, one conversation about, yeah, how how rough do you anticipate it being? And he goes, no, not very, like a little bit, but not yeah. that looser than I've done before. But no, don't go full born supremacy. Right. And right. and he would just call me every now and then before she did and say, you know, how's it looking? And I go, yeah. You got it, and and, it, and, and if he didn't, there wasn't really a lot we could do because the the schedule was a sort of a shark. Just had to keep moving forward. Like if you're shooting on a location, like as we were doing with devs or men, where you're in a, the same place, there was actually the opportunity to go back. And if something was missing, or you, or I, or I just felt it would be really helpful to have this. You know, nine times out of ten, it was possible to get within the schedule. Whereas on this, it was kind of like, yeah, it would have been nice, but really, there was all, there was really no looking back. So it just had to keep going, and then we just had to find creative solutions in the edit to fix anything that may have, yeah, you know, not. It's even interesting that you talk about you had to go so fast, and you're kind of like you weren't framing it up in the typical Alex Garland way. It makes it feel more realistic, and it feels more almost like a documentary. Yeah, it um, definitely has some of that. But yeah, it's yeah. not it's not nearly as, as jagged as some of those right. sort of verite right. style. It doesn't, I mean, it's interesting to me, to some extent, the, the language of the response has often been that it's very sort of handheld and, yeah. and documentary style. To me, it's, it is a lot smoother than that. It, it is, you know, if you compare it to something like the Blair Witch or something like yeah. that, it's nothing, you know, it's a million miles in terms of how right. how sort of carefully composed a lot of it is. But if the majority of the movie was handheld and the camera was moving with them with that sort of shaky cam sort of style, we're a bit more inside of the world. If that kind of language is kind of uh, instinctively created where there kind of is a bit more of an objective view, how were you then able to then help us, guide us in the audience in kind of observing this world with that sort of very small degree of separation but yet we still felt that this was an incredibly realistic movie. It was always the intention, certainly, that it felt plausible. Um, and certainly within those, within the tension of the scenes, it requires a, the suspension of disbelief to kind of yeah. to buy into it. And it never wanted to feel sort of like a movie movie in the kind of Hollywood terms. I mean, one of the key decisions is not so much editorial as Sonic, which was that we realized that we were never going to use underscore. But obviously, there is score in the film. And on obviously a few needle drops. But they never, we never sort of go, oh, this is a scary scene, let's play some scary music. Shit! Early on, that was my instinct in places, but then uh, we realized that it just, it just made it feel too, too forced. playing scary music there is a fear within that that the audience don't go with you because it's such a it's such a crutch that we all rely on is we want a moment to be scary it put some scary music on there so journalistically we're trying to put in the same way that the yeah. the characters in the film are just going this is just what so we're not we're not trying to give an opinion about what's happening we're just right. saying this is what's happening It did rely on, you know, partly the performances of the characters, you know, playing the scary or the to to sell those things. When people say the film felt really real, they don't. What they actually are saying is, you there was no music on it. In some, in some, they don't know that's what they're saying. You know, it's, it's a combination of the no music, the relatively sort of verite camera style, and and then the authenticity of the performances, and then not trying to force too much editorially with trying to keep it relatively uncutty in places, so that you're not really making you're not cut into extreme dagger close-up like to sort of make to really show attention draw attention to itself you know one of the most important parts of a movie like this is we have to tell the audiences how this movie is going to feel and i was very nervous on how this movie was going to open of the president just walking in and it was kind of just very silent
We are now closer than we have ever been. Tell us about how important it was opening the movie with this type of tone. That opening was one of the hardest things to find in the editing process. And it was the biggest divergence from the script that Alex had written. The screenplay opened with a prolonged flashback, which we still use bits of later in the film, which, but it was the scene where ultimately the guy gets set on fire in a sort of African conflict. Which then we then cut to her waking up on an airplane and then she landed in America for the first time and she meets Joel's character at the airport and they drive and as they drive through the city, Joel gives her a kind of state of the nation contextual mm. update about the state of America at this point, which a lot of the audience seems to have thought of, <laughs> it's a lot of the information the audience were kind of clamoring for. But for months and months, we wrestled with trying to get these scenes as written to work and be the opening. And to your point, they just, Alex was just like, this is such an unassertive, uninteresting way to start the film. I just, it has to start with a kind of something tonally more appropriate to what yeah. we want it to be. And it's just mm -hmm. the very first day we actually shot Nick Hoffman's presidential speeches because they're only ever meant to appear on TV. As I said, they were sort of shot that frontal TV POV mm -hmm. camera thing. But then Big Alex, he sort of decided once he'd done that, he wanted to riff some improvisational stuff. We are now closer than we have ever been. Because he just quite often just has instinctive feelings that certain things might be in, it might come in handy at some point. Mm -hmm. So he shot all this stuff, which we didn't have any place for. It didn't have any purpose. And for three months, we completely forgot it even existed. Mm -hmm. And then once we were trying to sort of, how do we start this film in an interesting way? Mm -hmm. And Alex, I had a dream last night. I remembered I shot all this stuff. And he just pitched the idea to me and I instantly understood what he was getting at. And I cut it, found the footage. Some are calling it already. We are closer than we have ever been to victory. And really from that first, you know, he pitched an idea, left the room for a bit, came back, watched it, was like, yeah, exactly, that's, we finally got the start of the film. And we didn't really change it much after that. The only additional thing really came after that was the interstitial cuts of little bursts of real world media, which actually came from a suggestion of Danny Boyle, if I'm, oh. uh, who he watched. But he, Danny's suggestion being the provocateur that he is was to use footage, explicitly footage from January the 6th. And we, it was slightly yeah. count, it was a bit too on the nose for Alex, so we sort yeah. of didn't, but we took the sort of inspiration from, from that suggestion and then um, tried to find more ambiguous imagery. The greatest victory in the history of military campaigns. For me, those jump cuts and they were quite jarring. Oh, yeah, cuts. and there's yeah. little, I mean, I think I heard you guys use the phrase, and I don't, it, I know, I mean, film's quite a, I think Oliver Stone would call it a vertical cut, where you sort of, you cut to an emotional response, like he'll say a line which seems serious. Some are already calling it the greatest victory in the history of military campaigns. Then you cut to 18 frames of him smiling, which yeah. sort of kind of makes you feel that like it's insincere or something, or whatever. It's like a, it feels like an emotional insight into the guy, whereas actually, I mean, and it was just a literal, I mean, it was just jumping to a different bit. And actually, there's, You're emotionally there's, manipulating yeah. everybody. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. <laughs> but it's also quite a funny thing, which I think is, I think it's still audible in the sound mix. I can't tell that actually the, there's a kind of muffled voice you can hear in the background, which. And that's just Alex directing Nick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello. Hope you guys have been enjoying the conversation so far. But with all of this, I would like to ask you a question. So we've all had that experience when we've been editing a music track and there is just this one weird little element that we just don't want. Like why do musicians put that in there? It just ruins the whole track. So as a benefit when track clubs mix lab can mean that you can get the stems. So for example, we've got this nice little piano song. Yeah, I can work with that. But I do want a bit more control. So I am going to use the mix lab. And look at this. All of the instruments separately. So actually, I might just like the strings. I mean, that's already a completely different tone. So the strings could be interesting. But we're also on YouTube. That actually might be a bit too slow paced. So I'm going to speed up the BPM of all of this to screw it 115. So like imagine if I'm trying to like escalate information, there's like some sort of new revelation in the story, let's increase the pace. So I've got completely different versions of the same song and I can download them and of course throw them into my edit. This tool obviously gives the editor the power to tinker and really manipulate the track that they want for their edit. You're no longer tied down to what the track is, you can make the track what you want it to be. And on top of all of this, Track Club has streamlined the copyright process, as in you won't get hit of any copyright claims when you use their music. So give Track Club a try with a two month free trial by clicking the link in the description. Let's get back to the conversation. Don't try driving on. This guy's a good shot.
So, I mean, you've got the, the sort of surreality of seeing these two guys and their, and their weird face paint and the, just the whole, and the tableau behind, the sort of ludicrous tableau behind them, which, and then in, in, in editorial terms, I'm always interested in, in giving context. Like, I, I think some, some scenes benefit from disorientation, but so a frame like this gives you a very clear map of where everyone is, which just, because I think for me, the scene is hopefully quite funny. And I think sort of disorientation and confusion is kind of the enemy. So at this point, you know, but it's important to know the gaunt that, that Wagner's character has got to run. So he's, he wants, clearly he wants to get to the foreground, but so we understand the distance he's got to run, what he's, uh, right. as he's gearing himself up. So uh, it just gives, you know, it's, not, it's just a small pop just to give you a kind of context. What's going on? Someone in that house, they're stuck. We're stuck. Who do you think they are? Mm, no idea. Hey, we're press. Cool. To me, in a perfect world, the starting point for a scene, especially a scene like this where it's quite composed, is you would try and use every frame they shoot and only once. Mm, yeah. It's sort of, that's like the perfect. Yeah, if, it get, if it gets in the way of telling the story properly, then forget about it. Yeah. But if you can do that, that's sort of, it's and like a re, you give yourself a sort of pat on the back of, and, and sometimes, especially with B and sometimes even C cameras, there are frames that you just frankly, they were just keeping someone busy on the day and there is no reason to use them. But if, <laughs> but as long as the shots are good, I will always try and work out the perfect place to put them and tell the story as effectively as possible. And then you work your way. So you tried your best to only be using each frame once. Yeah, so, well. so you, see, you see this frame and you kind of go, okay, it's a cool frame. We should use it. What's the perfect place to use it? And it's as he's psyching himself up to run to the foreground. So you understand where he's... But this, to run to. but this frame would have shot essentially the entire scene oh, anyway. Yeah. So you oh, had yeah. that luxury. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you, yeah. Only... Oh, no, you can pop to it anytime you want. No, this, I mean, everything, all of, I think I'm right in saying every scene in the film was shot at, at scene length. Mm. Wow. Um, oh, wow. They, 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 they sometimes finding new camera positions within them. But those, but the White House corridor scene, every single take was five minutes long. That's a lot so, to go through. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. I think we can move, we can get to that as okay. well in a bit. That sounds but, exciting. Yeah, but, but, yeah. Yeah. Someone in that house... So with that, I mean, that shot there, that deep focus thing, I mean, I think, again, to that point about wanting to use shots very selectively, and have the, I think one's always looking for shots that allow you to, you know, the, the common phrase is ping, the avoid ping pong. This scene has a lot of back and forth, but they're, very, they're almost all very short lines. Mm. So if you're always cutting on each line, you get into a very cutty rhythm. So you're always wanting to try and find a way to, and sometimes you can just sit on someone's close up and not, you know, just just hear the line, and that's also fine. But but that was a nice frame to sort of. Yeah. We, we always like this concept, it's like yeah, the yeah. reason to not cut is always oh, far no, more no. interesting to when you should cut. No, I was a director. I work with a lot of these, you know, you can, editors. You you act like you're paid by the cut. <laughs> 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 I, and and most directors I work with, you know, the less less is more really. Less and, is more. and then unless you're in an action sequence or something like that. But if it's a dialogue scene, then the the less cut you can make it, the the better. Are you WF? Who's giving you orders? No one's giving us orders, man. Someone's trying to kill us. We are trying to kill them. You don't know what side they're fighting for. Oh, I get it. You're retarded. Was there anything you did to enhance the comedy in, or the timing of it? Because it's so, it's so out of left field, especially when, when you just watch all the pr scenes proceeding and they're so... Tension film. Which is yeah, just, just <laughs> ran over on a dead body just before yeah. this. Well, yeah. I mean, partly it's, you know, the writing is, uh, you know, it was unexpected, the sort of comedic scene on, in the script. And Carl's very good in his sort of deadpan delivery. I don't think I was, sometimes with certain actors, you you absolutely can force the the timing of a, of a punchline or something by distending a cut. It's usually adding more time than taking away time. Mm -hmm. But it depends. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why you can't generally play movies and masters is because actors leave way too many pauses. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just, just like it, this bit is a bit deadly. Anyway, in terms of landing a comedic beat, quite often you're adding time. But I think, to be fair to Carl, I think his comedy timing was on point. So I don't, I, I wouldn't want to take credit for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there is still the underlying tension in all. This is like a, a breath of fresh air in the whole movie, despite yeah. the fact that just before he just. Well, ran again, over it's, and, it's yeah. that going back to the thing of trying to mix, like not give the audience what they're expecting to get. And every scene has a kind of tonal distinction, I think, within the film. I don't think there's any one scene that's pretty much exactly like another scene that's or true. in terms of giving you the same exact right. flavor of yeah. thing. You know, it, it's... So this was, yeah, this was a kind of... I say this is kind of a hopefully slightly funny, slightly surreal, slightly um, dreamy kind of 
or, or yeah, surreal scene. So there's Kirsten's character who's just not, you know, that's an allusion to being to just sort of state of being being interested in something other than the war going on around her. Uh, it was a detail that was actually written into the script by Alex. Alex's films do a great job of blending like beauty and something crazy happening, like mm. and the beauty of nature. But not, but they, uh, but at the same time, yeah, leaving space for you to interpret what you want to interpret mm. out of it. As I say, I don't, and again, I never had, I never needed to have a conversation with him about what it meant to him, but I know what it meant to me. It sort of meant that it, it's a, it's again, it's a, it's a staging post in Lee's internal journey from being a hardened war photographer through to where she ends up, which is, you know, essentially having full blown PTSD but I, I'm just being vulnerable. I, I, her outer shell is sort of slowly being dismantled yeah. um, throughout the course of the film. But, but this was, I think one of the most important shots in the film, because as you mentioned, there's a really interesting divergence between uh, Lee and Jesse where uh, Jesse is engrossed. She is wanting to yeah. get that shot. Whereas Lee is like, I just don't care yeah, she's anymore. In, she's in the flush of youthful, you know, um, for her it's all new and shiny and exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. yeah. But I think for all of that, that's quite interesting to explore in terms of those two characters and those diverging paths. And a lot of that, again, is shown rather than told. How are you in the editing and in the storytelling able to help convey essentially both of their character arcs throughout the movie. Well, I mean, in, in leading into moments like this, essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, they have to shoot material, but we, you know, this was an important beat to explore and we never, we never, you know, we never considered cutting it. This has a corollary to the, the scene we're talking about at, at the college that you, mm -hmm. as you used to call it, where she, mm -hmm. you know, Jess, Lee's looking at her at that point, Lee's more engaged in the war. She's looking at a burning building that time and she looks at Je Jess says, and now here she's, Looking at, looking at nature then there's a scene in the car uh, where she looks behind her and Jesse's taking stills as they drive along through the b barren landscape so this is sort of I guess part three of a kind of Lee watching watching Jesse do her for, for, you know, essentially do her job mm -hmm. and, and each one has a slightly different is, is an evolution of the last, I guess. Mm -hmm. So as far as the perspective that um, Lee has just watching Jesse especially in this scene there's just a very distinct character arc honestly slightly mirroring each other and a handoff of perspective from Lee's character to Jesse's character how are you able to make it so um smooth with the transition in that perspective because a character perspective editorially is a big deal I mean thank you for I mean uh, <laughs> somewhere in there is a compliment um another another key scene is this one of the boat in in relation which is really the last conversation the characters have in the film is at the boathouse where where Jesse says, you know, I've never been more scared in my life and I've never felt more alive. And, and then Lee gives her a look afterwards, which is essentially, you're fucked. <laughs> I think. I mean, but yeah. there's a sadness in it. And it's like, you fully drunk the Kool-Aid. You are, there's no, you, yeah. clearly you're not going to go back from this point. You are now a, a junkie. And in relation to the conversation they just had, which was about the death of Sammy and him being, a, you know, the, that being a played out thing. And so really at that point, that's the film saying Jesse's fate is sealed. And then, but then the Washington sequence is the play out of that, right. which is that right. in passing, in a sense, in passing the battle or seeing it being passed in that moment, Lee's something is shed, like she, it's almost the, her last step on the journey to, to, so suddenly she's too vulnerable, like because Jesse's taken her mantle, mm. suddenly Lee's vulnerable to the, she, her impermeable shell of you know, being yeah. this color, is somehow gone and you know, she does sort of rally towards the end and her, her inner steel comes back. But for that period, that initial period of Washington, at least, you know, Jesse's suddenly a full-blown war photographer and Lee, for the first time in the movie, sort of isn't all yeah. of a sudden. Um, it's almost like, you know, they can't coexist sort of one uh, until then that final sequence they they do for a brief period of coexist. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for coming. That Thanks was great. So yeah. <laughs> that was so awesome. That was really awesome, yeah.